Today I will be talking about the tension bend principle. A lot of us have been confused what is tension bend principle. Is it the tension bend wiring or is it something else? So if we see the human body, the weight bearing axis is not perfectly aligned with each bone. If we see any bone, one surface is close to the weight bearing axis while the other surface may be away from the weight bearing axis. For example, if we take the femur bone, the weight bearing axis is medial to the medial side of shaft femur. And if you see the morphology of the femur, it is slightly curved. You can say that the center of hip joint and the center of knee joint are somewhere here and remaining part of the femur is away from these centers. Therefore, there is an eccentric loading. That means the load on the outer side is in opposite direction compared to the load on the inner side. Whenever there is bending force, the inner side is going to get compressed while the outer side is going to get distracted. So this principle can be applied to any bone in human body. One surface is facing the tension force while the other surface is facing the compression forces. For example, here in tibia also you see whenever there is angulation, usually it is in various direction. And because of that, this side, the medial side is in compression while the lateral side is in distraction. Again, this is the tension side and this is the compression side. If we see the complex areas like proximal femur where we have dense trabecular arrangement, even there also the loading is different while on the medial side it is in compression and on the lateral side it is in tension. Therefore, we call these trabeculae on the lateral side as the primary tensile trabeculae while the trabeculae on the medial side are known as compression trabeculae because of the forces that are acting on these trabeculae. Therefore, whenever there is neck femur fracture, this side is getting compressed while this side is getting distracted. Again, this is the tension side and this is the compression side, which often results in varus and that is the main deforming force which leads to failure. So what is eccentric loading? So if we take a piece of chalk and break it into two, again there will be a surface which is close to the bending direction and there will be a surface which is away from the bending direction. So the surface which is away from the bending direction on which the tension is being applied which brings distraction on this outer surface is the tensile surface. And this kind of loading when the forces are compressing on one side and distracting on the other side this is known as eccentric loading. That means the loading on the peripheral part is different compared to the centric part. So the part which is close to the bending direction is the centric part and the part which is away in the periphery is the eccentric part. So eccentric part is going to go in distraction or tension while the centric part is going in compression. And when we place a device fixation device on the tensile surface that means the eccentric surface or the eccentric surface then apply the bending force then automatically it remains stable. Why? Because there will be tension on this part and this fixation fixation device will not allow distraction at this breakage point while this side there will be compression and once the compression has been achieved here it will automatically prevent further loading of this device that means it will remain inherently stable so if bending is attempted something like this happens that means the cortices or you can say the ends of the chalk are matching each other on the compression side and on the tension side the fixation device strength is preventing further distraction and further bending of the device is not happening because of the compression here that means it is an inherently stable construct so this kind of principle is the tension bend principle and it is irrespective of the device that has been placed on the tensile surface but the condition should be that the compression side should get contact whenever bending force is applied that means they are going to limit the bending force on the tension side so this is a kind of tension bend fixation so why not apply a tension so why not apply the fixation device on the compression side so what will happen if we apply the fixation device on the compression side something like this because there is no check to the bending tensile surface is going to open up there is no limitation over there and this the loading of the fixation device will result in bending or even failure so there's no check to the bending force unlike the previous scenario in which the compression side contact was preventing further bending of the fixation device. So this principle can be applied to other regions also in which there is some kind of rotatory force which results in the vector direction away from the flexor side on the outer surface and towards the flexor side on the inner surface. So the tuberosity fractures, oligarch fractures and avulsion fractures they all can be fit in this kind of principle. In oligarch the dorsal surface opens up while the volar surface gets tilted towards the side 
in trochanteric aversion also that means greater trochanter fracture the outer parts rotates proximally while the tip part or inner part gets tilted downwards so kind of opposite force on the two different surfaces in the malar fractures also because of the pull of the ligaments the articular part get tilted inwards while the fracture side opens up from the medial side and in patella also the two fragments rotate away from the fracture side and there is rotation in an opposite direction on the inner surface that means so whenever subjected to a bending force there will be a centric surface which will be close to the direction of bending and there will be an eccentric surface which will be away from the direction of bending force so clinical application of tension bend principle is in form of different kind of plate fixation that we apply in a normal situation when the plate is applied on the tensile surface so any implant like lcp when when placed on the tensile surface of any bone when in a simple fracture is going to act like a tension bend so what is tension bend wiring so whenever the fracture fragments are small or the fractures are simple one in case of good healthy bones and when the plate fixation is not required because of the implant prominence short profile of the bone then we can use the low profile tension band which is in form of tension band wiring it is also known as a class compression wiring because it is in form of an ss wire loop that brings compression at the fracture site so in tension band wiring we use the ss wire which provides a band on the tensile surface and we use 2k wires close to the articular surface that provide additional rotatory and translational stability and also these wires provide checkpoints for containment of the wire loop so mostly we use the figure of 8 loop contrary to the circular loop because when we use the figure of 8 loop the maximum tension occurs in this zone which is close to the center of the tensile surface while in case of a circular wire this part will remain void of any such bend and the opening here may not get controlled by this loop which is away from this maximum tension zone so ss wire loop in form of 8 loop is preferred whenever we are planning for tension band wiring we have to be ready with the instruments so bone hooks like this like a large one and a small one the bone clamp the plier the k wire guides the drill bit the wire impactor hammer ss wire and k wires should be ready whenever we are planning our fixation with tension band wiring first thing the prerequisite is the anatomical reduction so first effort should be anatomical reduction in case for example here you see the patella has been perfectly reduced the fracture line is barely visible you can use hook clamps to tighten the reduction to get a good picture so once reduction has been done we have to pass two parallel k wires k wires should be passed in such a fashion that they should cover the broadest area of the fractured bone like here in olecan we have to use two wires which should span most of the olecan and in patella also we have to use two wires which should cover most of the area over the superior surface of the patella and a k wire guide can be used the k wire guide is helpful because you can use multiple k wires which are parallel to each other without using the sleeve you may find difficulty in perfectly aligning the two wires but in case you have this sleeve which have holes for multiple parallel k wires then definitely that is going to be helpful so you have to pass two k wires which are parallel to each other and they should be away from the articular site but close to the subcondral bone because if they remain close to the subcondral bone they will remain in a most stable location and they will prevent the rotation and translation at the fracture site so here in olecan they should be close to the articular surface when seen in the fluoroscopic view and in patella also they should be close to the articular surface and the rough mark is to go 5 mm deep from the antero superior surface of the patella in case of olecan fractures you have to create a drill hole 5 cm distal to the fracture site because unlike patella we can't contain the ss wire loop behind the k wires here the ss wire loop can be contained behind the k wires here but here that possibility is not there therefore we have to create a separate tunnel here inside a strong bone that means diaphyseal bone to create ss wire loop proximally we have the exposed ends of the k wires so the ss wire can be passed behind these k wires and this drill hole should be around 2 mm in diameter for easy passage of the ss wire and it should be centrally located on the lateral or medial surface whichever surface you are using for drilling a 2 mm drill bit is sufficient for creating such an hole or you can use a k wire also then you have to create a track proximally underneath the insertion of triceps and behind the k wires and as close to the bone as possible because only then your ss wire loop is going to get best tension and the fracture site will gain good compression in patella also you have to create track behind the insertion of the 
quadriceps tendon proximally and patellar tendon distally and behind the k-wire and closest to the bone as possible and before passing the ssy you can create an optional loop like this that can be kept around one or two centimeter of the distal hole this loop will help in uniform compression as i will show in the next slides so the ssy then has to be passed in a figure of eight position like I've told you, beneath the tendon insertion and behind the K wires and as close to the bone, then the wire is twisted again on the opposite side in line with the previous loop. So the wire will be twisted some way here so that we gain uniform compression when tightening the SS wire. So we are now ready with two twisting points here on the medial side and on the lateral side as well. We can sequentially twist the SS wire at these twisted points so that the compression is occurring equally on this side and this side. And once you are done with the compression at the flexure side, you have to check for the correct length of the K wires. So here you see the K wire is slightly protruded. You have to withdraw the K wire around 1 cm back to the cortex. So ultimately the K wire will come somewhere here. Do not perform this step simultaneously for both the K wires. It will be better to do in a sequential process. Because if there is slightest doubt about the bone quality, if you are loosening both the wires then probably that will hinder the reduction or the tension on the SS wire band. So one wire at a time is a better choice. So now you have withdrawn the K wire one centimeter till here. After that, you have to cut another one centimeter of the wire and the end should be sharply cut. And after that, at this one centimeter distance, you have to start bending of the wire so that this end is rotated almost 180 degree to create a hairpin bend like this. And once that has been done, this can be impacted back in the bones so that there is no prominence of the implant. And by this step, the wire will again go back one centimeter, which was earlier withdrawn and it will be close to the cortex as required. The same step can be performed for the other wire also. And in case of petla, we don't have this issue because we create a band proximally impacted, then cut the protruding prominent part distally. And this step is not required there because both ends of the K wires have been exposed. So we should achieve something like this. That means these bands should get impacted inside the bone. In Petla also you should try for that, but the bone here is quite strong. So you may find difficulty in impacting the wire bands, but you should try because any prominence here may result in early loosening of your tension band wiring construct. Another thing, when tension band can fail. So earlier scenario you saw there was contact here, but anything that is hampering the contact here can result in failure of the tension band. So if we have this section at the flexure site, so the contact here will come at very late stage and by that time the implant may have failed like this. And in case of comminution on the compression side, then also this may fail because the comminution may give way because the comminution may result in excessive shortening on the compression side and ultimately the bending here will be more and the stress on the implant may be higher. So it may bend or it may fail. So these are two scenarios in which you should avoid any tension band fixation like in comminuted fractures and in case of tension band plating whenever there is combination on the compression side the tension band plating should be avoided. So by now it should be clear what is the tension band principle it can be applied to any fixation device that is placed on the eccentric side that means away from the bending force and it has to be done only in case of simple fractures in case of those scenarios whenever there is combination on the compression side it's better to go for better biomechanical mechanically strong fixation devices like dual plating or intramedullary nailing. So I hope this information was helpful for you. Thank you.